All of that aside, I'm going to dive into some background information on 1 Timothy, uh, our main characters of the church of that day, uh, the historical context of the church. It will also be helpful for us to gain a better understanding of the text that we look at as we work through the rest of it through the series and who it is that we are dealing with in this book. Our sermon title today is An Introduction to 1 Timothy, and a subtitle, if you would like to write it down, is A Spiritual Father and Son Working for the Spirit, the Father and Son. A Spiritual Father and Son Working for the Spirit, the Father and Son. So a bit of background on 1 Timothy. Paul, whilst in Roman prison, penned a letter to the church of Ephesus around 60 to 62 AD. This is the prison epistle that we know as the book of Ephesians. Ephesians is the, uh, well, the Ephesian church is the same church that Paul leaves Timothy in charge of after his release from that prison stay while he went on a tour visiting several cities that he had ministered to previously. The book of Ephesians was written one to two years before 1 Timothy. The former, Ephesians, serves as a letter of encouragement and admonition to the believers at Ephesus. It is written to remind them of their immeasurable blessings in Jesus Christ to live a life worthy, sorry, and to live a life worthy of these blessings. Whilst the latter, 1 Timothy, is a letter directed to the leader of the church at Ephesus. It is a letter for pastoral care. It's a letter um, to help with oversight of the local church. And although addressed to Timothy, it is not a private communication just to Timothy. It is for the whole church. Since in chapter 6, verse 21 of 1 Timothy, Paul uses the plural form of a Greek word when expressing his desire for God's grace over the congregation instead of just Timothy. There were a number of problems that had risen up in the church, such as false doctrine. There was disorder in their worship. Um, They had a need for qualified elders, and the Ephesian church had a serious problem with materialism. The Ephesian church also had some false teachers that had plagued the church. They had myths, introduced myths into the church, and minus genealogies that had nothing to do with their order of, of worship. They also forbid marriage, which is quite weird in a church. We normally try and get all the single people married quite quickly. And uh, they also encourage abstaining from certain foods. These men did not understand Scripture correctly, but they preached their ungodly ideas with confidence, which produced harmful speculation in the Ephesian church. Sadly, these men were also thought to have been elders, They were supposed to be the ones overseeing the church. And instead they were sowing discord and false doctrine. Thus Paul left his entrusted son of the faith to correct this and other administrative issues in the Ephesian church. In 1 Timothy 3, 14-15, Paul writes to Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of truth. Such was Paul's desire to correct these things in the Ephesian church that Paul wanted to be there himself. Knowing that there might be a delay, however, in getting to Ephesus, he was wise enough to send a letter ahead of himself to help Timothy to carry out this task. With that background in mind, let's open our Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy and read our text for today. Our author's greeting in this letter introduces us to the role players in our pastoral epistle. So we'll be reading 1 Timothy from chapter 1. Let's meet our spiritual father in this text. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Right off the bat, 
in verse 1, we have our first role player in our text, and that is Paul. Paul hardly needs an introduction, but for the sake of a refresher, let's take a quick look at who Paul is or was. Paul was a Jew. He was a very zealous Jew whom, rising through the ranks of the men of Jewish esteem, made it his mission to persecute this church that had started. Paul approved of the execution of Stephen by stoning. It's our first introduction to him in Acts 8, verse 1. Two verses later in Acts 8, verse 3, Paul says, uh, Acts 3 says, sorry, Acts 8, verse 3 says this of Paul, who was still called Saul at that time. It says, But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering the house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. In Acts chapter 9, we come across Paul's conversion when he goes from persecutor to persecuted, where instead of ravaging the church of Christ, he preaches Christ boldly. He's building up the church of Christ and strengthening it wherever he goes. Paul goes from making Christians suffer to suffering for Christ. Acts 9 16 says, For I, this is the Lord speaking, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. The suffering for the sake of Christ's name is described to us in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22 to 23. Turn there and follow along as I read. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22 to 33. Second Corinthians 11, verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I'm talking like a madman. With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A day and a night I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from our own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from these things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is made to fall, and I am not indignant? If I must boast, I will boast in the things that show my weakness. The God and the Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas, was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket, through a window in the wall, and escaped his hands. This passage of scripture makes our grumbling about most of the struggles we face seem pathetic in comparison. I don't know about you, but I have not been whipped. I have not been beaten until nearly dead. As a kid, I thought I was by my parents, but that wasn't the case. I have not been stoned, and I have not been shipwrecked. And I certainly have not gone with hunger or thirst. And yet our grumblings on a daily basis are more than Paul's. What shame on us. Turn to Acts chapter 9, verse 1, and read with me to verse 18 for Paul's conversion and the work that he does thereafter. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. This is where uh, Paul gets his name changed from Saul, a little lesser known name to the one that we know him as today. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, 
so that if you found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by a hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And, he, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight, and then he rose and was baptized. That's quite a remarkable change, isn't it? This is the great, zealous Jew. This is the Hebrew among Hebrews, thinking that he is glorifying God through his persecution of this blasphemous movement that claims that the Messiah has come and was crucified and killed at the hands of his fellow Jews. This is him. Now humbled before the Lord, he has received the Holy Spirit, receiving salvation and receiving forgiveness of his sins. Sins against God, sins against Christ, and against the Christians that he had wronged. And getting baptized, an outward public expression of his new faith that Christ had indeed come, that the Messiah had come to earth and he had died. And he had taken our sins upon him on the cross. This is that Jew publicly admitting that Jesus was indeed the Son of God and that the people that he was persecuting had been right all along. Can you imagine being one of those Christians that Paul had bound and thrown into you? into prison, dragged them off and chucked them like dogs into a, a prison cell, spitting on them, cursing them, you know, being, blaspheming God's name, blaspheming the Messiah of the Old Testament, and hearing the news that this crusader against Jesus' church had now been saved and become a worker of God's will. It would be very hard to uh, stay bitter at someone after that. Let's read on from verse 19 to see what becomes of Paul after his baptism. Acts 9 verse 19. Taking food, he was strengthened, and for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying that he is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. 
And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Jump down to verse 28. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. The Apostle Paul had been a great persecutor of the church. He was the reason the church in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria Samaria did not have any peace. He was the reason the church wasn't being built up. They were all terrified of him and those who were like him. And now that he has become a great proclaimer of Christ, the church finally has peace and could grow. He was a staunch figure in breaking the Christian church. And he has now become a staunch figure in building it up. It is this Paul whom writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy, giving instruction on the issues to be attended to in the Ephesian church. What a conversion story. Praise the Lord. In his infinite wisdom, he saved this man and used him greatly in growing the church then, but also now how important the writings of Paul through the Holy Spirit are still to us today. They're as relevant today as they were some 2,000 years ago. So let's continue reading 1 Timothy verse 1 and meet our spiritual son. So verse 1 says, um, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, our hope, to Timothy. My apologies, I've jumped the gun. We don't introduce our son yet. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, is what we want to stop on. We want to find out what this apostle of Jesus Christ means. An apostle is now a revered term that I think you can pay five rand for at the corner store and pick it up on your name if you're a pastor of any church around. But uh, an apostle actually has a specific meaning. It simply translated, it means a sent one. It means that if I send James to go and get me a glass of water, he's my apostle for water. You have to be sent by the one whom you claim to be speaking of to be an apostle. That uh, will come in the form of a command which is what Paul received from Christ Jesus. Paul was commissioned by Jesus Christ himself. And we know that this happened on the road to Damascus, which we just read in Acts chapter 9, verse 5. But I'll read it again. Acts chapter 9, verse 5 says, And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. Jesus himself would tell Paul what to do. A few verses down, in verse 15, the Lord speaks to Ananias and says, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. This is what Paul was sent to do. Jesus Christ himself confronts Paul in the most astonishing way with a blinding light and a loud voice that is even heard by those traveling with him on the way to Damascus. So astonishing was this encounter that his, his tra- fellow travelers were left speechless. And he was given this apostleship, apostleship job description, and it was to be sent out, one sent for Jesus Christ, spreading his gospel in all the land. After mentioning, Paul mentioned himself as an apostle, he continues, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the command of God, our Savior, and Jesus Christ, our hope. This is a bit of a confusing statement at first glance because it says that God is our Savior. We all know that Jesus is our Savior, so this is, you know, how does this all work? 
Is Jesus our Savior or is God our Savior? God our Savior is a title that was given to God. Um, it's unique to the pastoral epistles, the 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. It has its roots in the Old Testament. Some verses, if you want to jot them down, that uh, speak about God our Savior in the Old Testament. One of them is uh, Psalm 18, verse 46, and I'll just read through them. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Psalm 25, verse 5 says, Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Habakkuk 3, verse 18 Yes, I was also surprised to find that book exists in the Bible. It says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God is a saving God by nature. In His wisdom and grace, He planned from eternity past those whom He would save. Therefore, God has given the title as our Savior, it was by his command that we are saved. Following the title of God our Savior is the phrase, and of Christ Jesus our hope. God is our Savior because he predestined those whom he would save. And Christ Jesus is our hope because it is through his death on the cross that we are saved. It is through his death on the cross that he purchased salvation for Christians. He sanctifies us through his Holy Spirit in the present, and he will lead us to glory in the future. That is the glory of being with God for eternity. So God is our Savior, having predestined those whom he would save, and Jesus Christ is our hope, being the one through whom we are saved. That is 1 Timothy 1 verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior, and of Christ Jesus our hope. So we've been filled in on who Paul is, and now we get to finally move on to the next person we meet in verse 2, and that is Timothy. Read with me 1 Timothy 1 verse 2. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know that this letter is addressed to Timothy, but what do we know about him? Who is he? Timothy gets mentioned 24 times in the New Testament. So let's see what we can learn about him from these 24 mentions. I think that a man with Paul's CV doesn't just call anyone my true son in the faith. So there's got to be something special about this Timothy. Timothy's mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois were devout Jews who became believers in the Lord Jesus. And they taught Timothy the Old Testament scriptures from his childhood. You can find reference to this in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. Timothy's father, however, was not a Jew. He was a Greek. Timothy was from Lystra, a city in the Roman province of Galatia, which is part of modern-day Turkey. It is believed that it was Paul who led Timothy to salvation on his first missionary trip to Lystra, which is recorded for us in Acts 14. When Paul visited Lystra on his second missionary journey, Paul chose Timothy to accompany him. Timothy is estimated to be somewhere between his late teens and early 20s at this stage because in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, which is some 15 years later, after Timothy joined Paul, Paul still refers to Timothy as a young man. And it is said of those times that you were considered young if you were under the age of 40. Acts 16 verse 2 tells us that even at his young age, Timothy was well regarded and had a good reputation of godliness. 
Timothy traveled and ministered with Paul for the rest of the apostles' life. And together they traveled to places like Berea, Athens, Corinth, Jerusalem, Philippi. And Timothy was with Paul during Paul's first Roman imprisonment. Paul often sent young Timothy to churches as his representative, and one Timothy finds him on one such assignment. Timothy also gets mentioned in Acts 16, verse 3, which I'll only include because there might be some questions on it. Acts 16, verse 3 mentions that Paul took Timothy and circumcised him. And at this stage, we know that Timothy is a teenager, and that's very unusual for a Jewish tradition to do it uh, when you're in your late teen years. And this is not for his salvation, but rather the Jews knowing Timothy and knowing that his mother is Jewish but his father is Greek would not have allowed him as an uncircumcised person to preach in their synagogues. So Paul wanted Timothy to be circumcised so as not to offend the Jews. And this way, Timothy could preach both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Timothy had been to the Corinth church twice, so we know the issues that they had. He had been to the church at Thessalonica once, and then Paul sent him to Ephesus. All of that as a representative of Paul. He was a gifted young man, having learned all of the Apostle Paul's ways and the Apostle Paul's teachings. He may have been timid, a retiring person who was frequently ill. Hence, Paul suggests to Timothy not drink, not to only drink water, but also to drink a little bit of wine for his stomach's sake and frequent ailments. John Stott has a, a quote, and he says this of Timothy. So this is the profile of Timothy which we can construct from a number of Paul's references to him. He was young, diffident, which means he was modest or shy because of a lack of self-confidence, and he was frail. He was young, diffident, and frail. These three handicaps might have thought to disqualify him of taking charge of the churches in and around Ephesus, but they endear him to us, and the grace of God was sufficient for this need. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Timothy may have been timid and sickly, but by the grace of God he carried out his work for the apostle and to the glory of God with excellence, despite this being contrary to his nature. Timothy's love for God our Savior, for Christ Jesus our hope, for Paul and for his fellow believers in the churches that he attended, encouraged him to work through the issues at the churches that he was sent to go to and to minister to, even if he was shy and lacked confidence. So having been introduced to Paul and having successfully Facebook stalked Timothy, we can now tackle the my true child in the faith statement from Paul. In verse 2, Paul says to Timothy, my true child in the faith. Paul states this of Timothy because Paul ministered to Timothy as a youngster, and it was through Paul's ministry that Timothy was saved. Having been chosen to accompany Paul in his missions, Timothy was under Paul's constant teaching, and although not a physical father and son, the spiritual relationship must have been so close that Paul felt that Timothy was like a son to him. Paul was Timothy's spiritual father, and Timothy was Paul's spiritual son. It's not only Timothy, sorry, it is only Timothy and Titus that were given these terms of favor by this apostle. To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace. The grace, mercy, and peace in this greeting is a familiar greeting from the apostle in his epistles. It can be found in Romans 1 verse 7, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 3, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 2, in Galatians, in Ephesians, and in Philippians, to name but a few. 
John Stott once again explains this greeting phrase very well. He says, grace is, the kind, is God's kindness to the quality, sorry, grace is God's kindness to the guilty and the undeserving. Mercy is his pity on the wretched who cannot save themselves. Peace is his reconciliation of those who were previously alienated from him and from one another. I'll read that again. Grace is God's kindness to the guilty and undeserving. Mercy is his pity on the wretched who cannot save themselves. Peace is his reconciliation of those who were previously alienated from him and from one another. We had no relationship with God until we got his grace, mercy, and peace. And relationships between humans is very strained unless you have the same saving faith in Jesus Christ that unites us. This greeting from Paul of grace, mercy, and peace seems like a prayer. It seems prayer-like in his inference of these precious things onto the reader or the hearer. And that's all good and well, but simply inferring these things onto the reader or the hearer of this letter won't, won't do much. It's great to want that for someone, but if you can't actually let them have it, it's not, not very helpful. We might as well name it and claim it at this point like the charismatics do, or blab it and grab it and just speak things over ourselves. What confidence do we have in these wonderful things that Paul wants for our lives and the lives of the recipients of his writing? We have confidence that we will actually get these things because in ending in verse 2, we read, From God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. This is not just something that Paul is inferring over someone's life, but he's prayerfully asking for it from God the Father and our Lord Jesus. Paul's greeting in this manner is a reminder of the blessings that the saved already have received from the Lord, and it's an encouragement to share the gospel so that others may enjoy the same blessing of peace and mercy and of grace. And as we've seen earlier, Paul of all people understands the gospel. It has consumed him in his work as sent by God, and our, God our Savior in Christ Jesus to tell all the world who would listen of how Jesus died at the hands of the Jews to save the unworthy sinners and reconcile them to the Holy God. The fact that Christ did die as a spotless lamb to take our sins and to be placed under God's wrath in our place, because of that we do get to enjoy these things. It's not just mindless babble from Paul. It is hard facts that a missionary work-hardened work -hardened Paul in all his struggles and suffering understands and clings to. As a sent one, an apostle for God and Christ gleans much comfort and hope and wants to remind other believers, beloved believers, of the same comfort and hope that he receives from the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God. With that, our two verses at the start of 1 Timothy come to a conclusion. And after these first two verses, it doesn't take Paul long to dive right into the meat once his greeting is over. And even his greeting is rich and teaches us much. By way of going forward in this series, uh, into this epistle, one can look forward to learning about proper theological truths, such as the proper functioning of the law, salvation, the attributes of God, the fall of man, the person of Christ, election, and you can do that one, and the second coming of Christ. I'm joking, I'll do that one. I trust that these two verses alone have whet your appetite for the rest of 1 Timothy as much as it has whet mine. I look forward to taking us through the rest of this book, Lord willing, in the future. And if uh, the Albers and Andrew deem, it, uh, deem me worthy. But um, there is a lot to learn, and I'm very excited to get into that. Why don't you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time that we've been able to open your scriptures, Lord. 
And although just from two words in a greeting, we already get to understand the people involved in this book. We get to understand the heart of the spiritual father and the spiritual son and how they long to spread your gospel to those who do not know you, how they long to reach out to as many people as they can to tell them the wonders of salvation that we have in your son, our Lord Jesus, the wonders of the grace, the mercy, and the peace that we get in being reconciled back to you, the one true creator, God. That grace, that mercy, and that peace, Lord, that brings us such comfort on this earth in times like we had several weeks ago in riots, knowing that you, O oh God, are in full control of the situation. And not a sparrow falls to the ground without you knowing about it. So why should we be anxious about our lives here? We look forward, Lord, to the rest of the teaching in this book. We thank you for this time that we've been able to go through it. We thank you for the time of this worship service where we can sing songs that exalt your name to bring you praise. We thank you that we are freely able to open your word and to read from it. And we thank you that we are able to join each other in corporate prayer and to have this relationship with one another in fellowship at church. We pray now that as we close in song that you would be glorified by it and that you would also be glorified by our fellowship and the life that we live the rest of this week, that you would help us to grow to be one step closer to your son, the Lord Jesus, for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.